Uh, Lake did a fantastic job ending us off on 1 John, and so we're excited to kind of jump into the book of James. So if you guys have your Bibles or if you have your version app, if you turn to the book of James, we're going to dive right in. Um, this will be kind of an introduction as we go through chapter 1. We're going to actually read the entirety of chapter 1 uh, today, and then we're going to open with the word of prayer. So starting James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow, Due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphan and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. God, I pray that as I uh, unpack the first chapter of James that you would be glorified and that anything that um, you wouldn't want me to say tonight that it wouldn't come out, um, but anything that I need to convey and communicate, I pray for clarity. Um, and Lord, just a passion for your word, I pray that for all of us to be attentive to the wisdom that lies in the book of James. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so as we kind of go into the introduction of James, chapter one is very much an introduction. But I kind of want to give some background information because this is a new book. We did first John, and now we're getting into James. And if you guys know what the topic has been, it's been if you love God, right, you obey his commandments, right? That's what Jesus says in John 14, 15. And now we're looking at first John, and now we're looking at James because these are very applicable books. It's about if you have faith, then this is what it should look like. Here's the actions that should follow suit. So what is James? Well, we're going to ask a couple questions. Who's the author? Who's the audience? What's the genre? And what's the purpose? Whenever we get into the background of a book, we kind of need to know this. That way we have a context. And this context I'm about to talk about is actually really helpful in understanding what James talks about. Because James goes like, he talks about everything, it seems like. I mean, we just read it. It's like he's talking about wisdom, trials, and not doubting God. It's like there's a lot of information in this one little chapter. So the author is believed to be James, most scholars believe, who is the brother of Jesus, okay? So if you remember back then in the Gospels, right, his brothers didn't necessarily accept him as Lord and Savior initially, but it seems like based off of this book and also he's in Acts, it looks like he actually came to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. In fact, he's an elder at the Jerusalem church, okay? So if you remember, I think it's in Acts 15 when Paul is kind of debating whether or not the Gentiles are included in the gospel message now. He goes to the Jerusalem council and talks about it. Well, James was a part of that group, okay? And so we see that James now believes in Jesus Christ. He has a big part to play because he's in Jerusalem as an elder. 
And notice what he says, James in chapter one, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, yet he doesn't claim any high status or authority. He simply calls himself a servant, or as the Greek word says, slave. So he sees himself more in a spiritual relationship with Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and you can see this humility in this writer, how he approaches. He doesn't use his status to try to one-up one other people. He simply calls himself a slave, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the author. What about the audience? Well, it says here, chapter 1, to the 12 tribes and the dispersion. So during this time in Jerusalem, right, all the Pharisees were starting to enact a lot of persecution, so a lot of Jews would spread out and were dispersed among the Roman Empire. And it's believed that James is writing to several of these people. We don't know exactly what provinces or where they're located at, but he's writing to them to encourage them and to provide some wisdom in this letter. And so that's what the, the dispersion means, is all those Jews spread out across the Roman Empire. But he's still centered in Jerusalem. And the genre, well, it's a letter, but it's like a wisdom literature, okay? So it's a lot like Proverbs, and James actually gets a lot of his influence from the traditions of Matthew, because, I mean, Jesus was his brother, so I'm sure he's probably listening quite a bit, right? So all these things that he's talking about have been heavily influenced by the account in Matthew and, of course, the book of Proverbs. And this is an interesting letter because it's one of the major wisdom epistles. It's only one of the other epistles that's really wisdom literature, like Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. And so this is really interesting as we read through James. And you kind of get that because he kind of has a lot of short exposés on different topics, right? Kind of like the Proverbs, like every other proverb is some type of different topic, right? That's kind of what James, when you read it, kind of looks like. Well, we have the author, the audience, the genre. What about the purpose? What was the purpose of this book? Well, if you kind of get, and we're going to get into this a little bit later into the sermon, but the purpose is that he's writing to these 12 tribes, to the dispersed Jews, because they were being persecuted and struggling what most scholars believe, with economic oppression, okay? So we had these kind of middle-class poor Jews, and they were struggling under the hand of oppressive landlords, people who would charge them high interest or try to keep them under their thumb through loans or keeping them in debt, okay? And so this is their persecution. This is something they're struggling with. And remember, they were dispersed, right, because of persecution. And so James is writing to them to encourage them and to provide them wisdom for their trials, okay? trials, difficulties, and hardships. So we kind of read all of chapter one, but I want to kind of provide a quick little um, kind of a structure so we can kind of understand as we go through it. There are three major themes in the first chapter of James, okay? Just three, three major themes. Now, it's kind of confusing because it's, you know, he's all over the place. He's kind of talking about this, then he goes into wisdom, then he goes into the rich and the poor, then he goes back to doubting God, then he talks about temptation, then he talks about hearing and doing. And when you look at all of that, at first glance, it's kind of over- overwhelming. You're like, oh my goodness, where do we start? Where do we start with this book? Well, this is kind of the best way I think we can break it down, okay? So there's three themes. The first one is enduring trials, okay? And that's in verses two through four. And then the second, James 1 5 through 8 is about wisdom, and then James chapter 1, 9 through 11 is about poverty and wealth. Okay, these three major themes, and they do fit together as we go through the sermon. You guys are going to see how they correlate with one another, okay? So that's the first half. Now, that's in the order of the book, and then he goes back into the same three themes a second time. So the second half of James, same order, talks about enduring trials verses 12 through 18. Then verses 19 through 25, he talks about wisdom. And then verses 26 through 27, he talks about poverty and wealth. I know you probably can't read it from up here. That's okay. I just kind of wanted to show the structure of the text. That way you kind of know where I'm taking you here. So we have the first half of James. If it goes back. Okay. And then the second half. Same three themes. And we're going to talk about each of these themes. So when I talk about enduring trials, I'm going to be looking at both of those passages. Okay. And then when I'm talking about wisdom, I'm going to talk about the, both of those passages together. And when I talk about poverty and wealth, we're going to be talking about 26, 27 with the other first half. So that's what we're going to be doing. And the three major points, okay, and I'm going to give you guys the three points right away, is about rejoicing in trials, asking for wisdom in the trials, and boasting in Christ in the trials. That's how they fit together. So let's dive right in. Verses two through four, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the first major command that he tells the Jewish people, what does he say? 
Count it all joy. Consider, ponder, think of your trial as something good. That's pretty audacious, don't you think? Sickness, if you encounter sickness, if you encounter energy, in injury, count it joy. Someone passes away in your family, consider it good. When you lose your job, you face that hardship, that economic oppression, consider it good. I mean, kind of just, let's sit back for a while and really think, this is really audacious, James. What are you talking about? Like, what do you mean count it all joy? Do you think I'm enjoying this at the moment? <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, right? But what James is trying to get at is that we need to start looking at our trials and difficulties as something more than just suffering and inconvenience. Because it says in Romans, right, that God works all things for our good, right? That he's sovereign, he's in control. So the command is to rejoice in the face of any trial that comes our way. And he says various. He's not just talking about the economic oppression they're enduring. He's talking about any type of trial, various types, sickness, injury, financial burden, relational distress, betrayal, real persecution, any of those types of trials. He's saying consider it, count it, think of it as joy. I don't think he's really talking about emotion like, oh, put a smile on your face or be happy all the time when you're enduring hardship. What he's saying is see it in a different light. Consider it a joy. And the reason, verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So you guys know, like, one of the cool things about God is that when he gives a command or an instruction, he gives a reason behind it, okay? You ever had, like, your mom, like, you know, you're supposed to do these chores, right? And your mom's like, I need you to take the trash out, you know? And you've just been had a long day, and you're like, well, why do I got to take the trash out? And she says, because I said so, Right? She's like, I told you, I'm mama, and you're going to do it. But you're like, why? God's not really like that, okay? So I'm not trying to like dog on any moms and stuff, but <laughs> it's not really the best parenting because what you want to provide is a principle or a reason. So when God says, don't commit adultery, he's saying that because, the reason, because he's faithful. He cherishes faithfulness. When he says, do not kill, the reasoning behind that is because he believes in the sanctity and the value of life. When he says, consider accountableness, and let steadfastness have its full effect. Why? That you could be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing, meaning you'll be holy, righteous before God. That's his reasoning behind that. And what's really important is the testing of your faith. When you endure trials or hardships, it's testing the legitimacy or the genuineness of your love for God. If you love God, you will endure these trials you will trust in him in the midst of these trials. So that's the reason. What's the end goal? It's to have the crown of life. If you go down to verse, let's see, verse 12, right? On the second section, when he goes back into talking about trials, verse 12, he says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The reward is eternal life. The reward is relationship with God. Trials test our faith to be genuine or not genuine. They're kind of like status updates about your personal holiness, where you're at with God. Because, you know, it's like when you are put up against resistance or difficulty, right, that tests your strength, that tests your steadfastness, that tests your resolve in following God. So whatever trials you may be encountering or struggling with, that's the purpose. It's supposed to see how genuine and real you are. Because we can talk all we want about following God, right? We can talk, oh, yeah. You know, people are like, I can totally, like, you lift, you know, you know, I can bench press, like, 300 pounds. I can do that. It's easy. Not a big deal. But you can talk about it, but until you actually do it, until you actually feel the resistance and the weight, I'm not going to believe you, right? It's the same thing with trials and hardships. We can talk all day about trusting in God, but until we're in those situations where we have to, we won't truly know. So he's calling it joy. He says, consider it good because it's going to build confidence in whether or not you actually are trusting in God. Like Peter, right? Peter was like, oh God, you know, I'll, I won't deny you. I'll be with you. You know, he's up in there in the Lord's Supper and he's telling him, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to deny you. I'm never going to abandon you. I'm always going to be there with you. And then what happens a few hours later? The person's like, oh, I know you. You're, you're that guy who, who they're about to crucify. Why aren't you up there with him? Oh, no, I don't, I don't know him. 
No, no, no. You were, you were with him when he was doing all that teaching on that mountain one day. He's like, no, I don't know the guy. Three times he denies him. Peter wouldn't know his spiritual state, though, unless he was put in that trial because that revealed what was really going on in his heart. He was like, oh, I'm not that sold out for God. I'm not that sold out for Christ. But until the pressure was put on, he didn't know about that. Kind of like in this case, like, you know, if you guys ever had a frustrating professor before, I hear stories about this all the time, okay? You can talk all day about love, patience, kindness, forgiveness, right? But the trial, like, let's, let's just do like a trial run here, okay? Jeremiah, you got a professor that on, like, you have to go to career fair on Tuesday, okay? He decides to assign you, let's say something ridiculous, like two or three quizzes, right? And then for your lab, he's like, and do this random three-page memo just because. It's cool. And you're like, ah, oh, darn it. And then you got the, your design team, right? And you got three, or, three out of five people, no, let's say four out of five, who are just for some reason say, I can't do my part this week. And now it's your job, right? And then, better yet, at work, okay, let's say you work at Pizza Hut, okay? And I've worked there, and it sucks, okay? <laughs> that's, a, that's a trial in itself, just being there. <laughs> but you, the, your boss says, you got to work five hours overtime, Okay, which in, which in college, like five hours is a lot, right? And so you're like, this whole week's crashing down, and you got your career fair. You don't even have your resume put together. All these things are converging on you. That is a hardship, a difficulty, right? Now, you can talk all day about love, patience, kindness, and forgiveness, but how you react to your professor, how you react to your coworkers, how you react to people around you is going to say a lot okay, about your spiritual state, wouldn't you say? Because when the going gets tough, then you're like, oh, this is what's really inside of me. But you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know like, if you lash out whether that was in you or not, unless the trial was there. I mean, you can, cl- you can claim all day to run a marathon, but until you get up and start a 5K and start running like a mile, you're going to be like, oh, I thought I was more in shape than this. I remember doing that. I was like, I'm going to go run a 5K. And I made about a mile and a half, and I was like, I'm going to walk the rest of the way. <laughs> and I realized I can't just get up and run a 5K. Because until you get put in the hardship and the trial, you're not going to know where you're at. Like I said, trials are like personal updates, status updates about where you're at in your walk with God. And so just like that. In other words, and then we go into verses, let's see, verse 13 on, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Here's the danger. When our trials become temptations. Because like just in the the, the, the example with Jeremiah, right? When that happens, okay, he can react to his professor in one or two ways. He can lash out, and he can put him in his place, Right? You can, you can go after those four design team guys and be like, I'm going to pummel you to the ground, right? Or you can stand up for yourself. I'm not saying you need to be a pushover, but you can lovingly express, hey, this is what we need to do, or I can't do this, right? But it's when we're put in that distress and that trial, then now the temptation, that selfishness, that self-preservation starts to come out, and we're tempted to do that. Or we can choose the way that God calls us to, which is love, kindness, patience, right? So the trial test you. Which direction are you going to go? Are you going to be loving and kind, or are you going to become selfish and mean-spirited, bitter, unforgiving? What happens is when we don't do the right thing in the midst of that trial, you know what we do? God, why did you put me in that circumstance? I lashed out. I got angry. I didn't do the right thing. God, why did you tempt me? Why were you up there trying to control this situation so that way I would burst down and get angry. Because James knows we're going to blame God. We're going to complain about our circumstances, and then we're going to blame God in the midst of our trial. And James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted. He's not evil. He's good. He says, but each person is tempted by their selfish desires, by their selfishness inside of us. That's what draws us into sin. That's what makes the trial the temptation at times. He says in verse 16, 
Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. He's reminding them, don't doubt God's goodness in the midst of these trials and difficulties. If you do, you won't trust him. You won't run to him. He says, and when you lash out, when you do something wrong, don't blame God for your reaction. It's just showing you where you're at. So it's really important that we remember. He says in verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Meaning, you have eternal life because of him. Why would you doubt his goodness? Why would you blame him? Because he, he regenerated you. He saved you from hell. He, re, he, he created in you new life. Why would you blame him as being someone who's tempting you with evil? But in our trials, when we mess up, when we do wrong, we say, God, this is your fault. Maybe we don't say it consciously, but we definitely in our minds and our spirit towards him feel like, why didn't you change this up for me? Why weren't you there for me? And what James is saying is, don't, don't be deceived. Okay, That's yourself and it's coming out. Don't blame God for your wrong response in your trials. So application is pretty much don't complain or blame God. See your trials as a testing of the genuineness of your faith and the strengthening of your holiness. In many ways, it's how you view your trials that either benefits or damages your spiritual walk. Not so much the trial itself. It's how you view it, how you go about responding. Don't see your temptation or your wrong responses as God's fault. Don't blame God for your poor response. That's our fault. Number two, though, is asking for wisdom in trials, which goes into the second part, the second theme, right? Wisdom. In verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously and to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So you're kind of like, okay, James goes from trials to jump into wisdom. What's he talking about? What James is talking about is you need wisdom to navigate your trials. Going back to Jeremiah's example, right? How are you going to handle a professor, right, who has the authority over you? How are you going to handle team members who are responsible to do that work? You got to stand up to them. You got to be loving, right? How are you going to navigate having to add five hours overtime, but do it with gentleness, lovingness, and with Christ-likeness? That takes discernment. I can't tell you in that situation exactly what you have to do, right? You know the principles, you know the fruits of the Spirit, but we need to pray to God for wisdom to navigate those trials in our lives. So that's where wisdom comes from. How are we going to handle the trials? Well, ask God. He says, you want to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if you do lack, if in your trials and your temptations and your hardships, you are lacking in the ability to follow through, then go to God and ask him. And he gives generously. He gives without reproach, it says. Meaning God doesn't look at you and say, wow, you got to ask for wisdom. No, God knows he has the wisdom, right? He doesn't look at you as inferior to that. He knows you need him, and he's going to give it to you generously, right? He's, does, he's not one of those gods who's like, ha, I told you that you should have came to me. It's not at all how he acts. He gives generously and without reproach. So that's, that's the main point. What do we need to ask for? We need to ask for wisdom, discernment. God, how do I navigate these difficulties? How do I navigate financial burdens? How do I navigate these relational problems that I'm having? How do I navigate my work? How do I do it by imitating and being like you, God, by being like Christ, but yet trying to figure out how to solve these issues? Well, how do we ask for it? He says, but when you do ask, right, he says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That was verses 5 through 8, right? That second theme of wisdom. We need to not doubt God's goodness when asking him. We can ask God, but doubt in the same breath. You ever had those people that, like, ask for advice, right? They come to you and they're like, hey, I have a question. And you're like, okay, yeah, I want your advice. And you give it to them and they're like, don't really accept it. They're kind of like, whatever. So there was one time, me and my family and I, we went um, on a trip, and my brother, he, he has these funny spending habits. He gets really fixated on, like, like, a hat or a poster he wants to buy, right? So he found this, like, fedora hat, okay? And I was like, he asked me, he's like, he's like, Nicholas, do you think I should get this hat? 
And I was like, ah, I don't know. And he's like, now I think I need to get it. And I'm like, you're never going to wear that. It looks like a cowboy hat, and you're not a cowboy. <laughs> and he, then, he goes, then he goes to Courtney, my wife, asks her. Then he goes to my mom, asks her. Goes to my dad, asks her. I mean, asks him. <laughs> <laughs> And, and they all give him the same answer. It's not your style. Like, you know, there's certain things that certain people shouldn't wear, right? Because it's just not your style. <laughs> like skinny jeans. You'll never see me in skinny jeans because that's not my style, okay? And I hope that you people would tell me if I ever did wear skinny jeans, Nick, that's not okay, okay? <laughs> Doesn't work for you. So we tell my brother, we're like, don't get the hat. We tell him, like, he, 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 he like strains himself for like 30 minutes trying to figure out if he's going to buy this hat. And eventually he does. And I haven't seen him wear it since. And it's one of those cases where, you know, and he's great. He's awesome. I'm not, I'm not trying to dog my brother, but he's awesome. But it's kind of that idea when people ask you advice, right, but they don't really accept it, right? I mean, I've had a lot of people like that ask me about relationship problems or counseling, and I try to give them advice, and they're like, eh, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Do we do that with God? Do we ask God, hey, God, what do I do in this, this trial? What do I, I need your wisdom. What do I do? He gives it to us through his word, and we're like, eh, whatever. Because we maybe doubt his goodness. You see, if we see God as bad, if we see him as causing our pain and suffering, we're not going to trust and run to him. And we're not going to ask him for wisdom. Or when we do, we won't accept it. So that's what he says. We have to ask for wisdom. We have to ask for it, believing in God's goodness. Now, we go to verse 19, right? So that's the first half, right, of the part of James. Then he goes into the same topic in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Three pillars of wisdom. Really good action steps. Be quick to hear. Number one. Number two. Be slow to speak. Number three, be slow to anger. You want some wisdom on how to navigate trials? Those are some really good ones. They're basic. So basic. They're so straightforward. Quick to hear, not quick to speak, to say something. Slow to speak. So he says the same thing twice. Be quick to hear, but slow to speak, to hear people out. And be slow to anger, because anger does not produce the righteousness of God. When we get angry with people and we lash out, right? That doesn't produce righteousness. That's not producing the character. We're not loving God when we do that. Then what's the source of wisdom? He says this in verse 21. He says to put away all filthiness and wickedness. And what do we need to receive? The implanted word, the word of God. The Spirit speaking to us through the word of God. And we're supposed to receive it with meekness, realizing I don't have the wisdom to navigate these trials. You will not be able to endure hardships or struggles unless you go to God and realize I can't do this on my own. And we have to receive with meekness, with humility, God, I need your wisdom. We do it through prayer, asking God, like in the first part of James, and number two, by reading his word. But that's not just good enough, right? You can receive it, you can hear it, but then what does he say? This is the most famous, we know all this one, right? Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So you can hear God's wisdom, right, but you might not act on it. Kind of a a good application point for this is, do you remember what Lake preached on last week? Mm, What about Sunday at church? I mean, think about this. There's, There's days, and be really honest, I'm not perfect at this either, guys. You know, I'll read a Devo in the morning at 7 a.m., and then about an hour later, I'm thinking, what did I read? Like, I can't remember. Who was it by? And it's really sad. Or, or people ask me like three weeks after I preach, hey, Nick, what was your points from your sermon? And I'm like, um, the Bible? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good gauge. Are we really hearing and then applying? You know? And if you can't remember, maybe it's good to ask yourself, well, am I even remembering what I read in the Bible? Am I even applying these things then? Or am I hearing it and going out the other door? I mean, out the other way. That's a good question to ask, is are we doing, are we practicing wisdom? Otherwise, it's useless. 
He says it's silly. Have, have you guys ever looked at a mirror and then forgot what you look like? Do you guys kind of know what you look like? Jeremiah, do you know what you look like? Okay. What's your color of your hair? Good job. Okay. It's kind of that same idea where it's silly if you kind of look at yourself in the mirror, walk away, and then forget what's the color of your hair. In the same way, when you look at God's word and you see where you need to change and you walk away and you're like, I don't know what I need to change. I'm perfect. That's ridiculous. And that's what James is kind of getting at. That illustration is out there. But he says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, hint, God's word, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He's going to what? Receive the crown of life because he practices it. So we need to rejoice in our trials. We need to see it as something that is good, something that's renewing and conforming us to the image of Christ. Number two, we got to ask for wisdom on how to navigate trials. you got to ask for wisdom. And number three, and this is the one that is a little tricky because it's kind of really random, it feels like, but boasting in Christ in trials. Let's go look at verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. James, can you please stick on one topic? It's like, where is he going with this, right? He's talking about trials, wisdom, and he's like, all of a sudden he's talking about poverty and wealth, and you're like, what is, what's going on? This is where I told you guys the context is important. What's the trial that the people are facing that he's writing to? Economic oppression, right? The rich are hurting them, oppressing them, keeping them under their thumb. So that's why he brings up this topic of wealth and poverty. He says, Remember that the rich pass away, that wealth, physical comfort, and materialism passes away, but your character, your holiness, your righteousness, your image in Christ doesn't. Learn to boast in spiritual wealth, not physical wealth. So what does he tell the rich person? He says, you need to boast in your humiliation, your spiritual state that before God, you're a sinner saved by grace. And you who are poor, You need to boast in the fact that you've been exalted, that you don't longer live in shame because you are in Christ. Look at your spiritual wealth. So if you're physically wealthy, boast in your humble spiritual state. If you're physically poor, boast in your wealthy spiritual state. Then he says this. He talks about that sometimes, I think, in our trials, we want comfort, right? We don't want character. We don't want endurance. We don't want to be more like Christ. We want comfort, And that's what these people were wanting. They were saying, I'm being oppressed and I'm focused on myself and I want to be feeling good. I want comfort. I want to be rich. And and, and James is saying, don't don't forget the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will pass away. Nothing lasts. So we need to be after godly character, not just comfort. We need to not boast in our status before God, in our physical statuses or our wealth. We need to boast in Christ. That's who we need to boast in, that he's the one that renewed us and recreated us. So don't boast in physical wealth, boast in spiritual wealth in Christ. Remember that physical security and wealth does not always last. And pray for endurance, not for comfort. Don't pray that you can be comforted, right, in the sense of like a material comfort, but be, pray, pray, be praying that you're comforted by God and be praying for endurance to last the trials in our lives. In kind of summation, you may think of this and kind of say, okay, so there's some really good things we learned, right? You know, we got to rejoice in the trials, consider it as good that we're building character. We got to ask for wisdom and we need to learn to boast in Christ in the midst of difficulties and struggles. But sometimes it's hard because we're kind of like, well, where's Christ in all of this, right? Isn't God just kind of sitting there giving these things? Sure, it's easy for him to talk about the trials because he's up there in heaven all happy and and enjoying things, right? That's sometimes our initial mentality. But don't forget what Christ went through. I like what Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, for the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross, despising the shame. Who do you think counted it all joy to go to the cross? It's Christ himself. And what was the joy? To be with us. To die on the cross for our sins, to save us, to renew us, He considered joy in the trial. He sought wisdom from the Father, right? Like in the high priestly prayer, he goes to God and he prays for wisdom. He prays for connection with him. And we talk about boasting in our humility. Christ came 
Not with the rich, not with the kings and the queens and the magistrates. He came with the poor and the lonely. Born in a manger, right? Company of shepherds and farm animals. That was the state he came into, humbly. To kind of show it's in Christ that we find our salvation. So I want to, I want to encourage you guys to, in the midst of your trials and your hardships and difficulties, count it all joy because you're going to become more and more like Christ. There's a lot of trials and hardships. It's not all just these major persecutions or death or martyrdom. It sometimes are the little things, the relational distresses, the temptation to certain type of addictions, maybe you know, responding to your design team members or professors in a wrong way, or thinking really ill thoughts towards them. It could be any of those little things. And what's cool about this is now you can look at every trial and hardship not as an inconvenience, but as an opportunity to be conformed to the image of Christ. For the joy that was set before us, let us endure our suffering too, so we can be one with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity um, to gather together to read your word and to learn from it. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be conformed to your image in the midst of our trials and difficulties, that we would trust you and you only. Um, God, we thank you for the hope that we find in Jesus Christ, um, who endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, to be with us, so that we can be your people and you can be our God. And Lord, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.